Oh no, wait. Oh, I don't have your picture, Corinne. I'm so sorry. Oh, God, don't even worry about it. <laughs> That's my fault. We're good. We're good. Who, who needs a picture? Uh, the, the, real, the real deal, Corinne, is right here. I was on Zoom with us. So, Corinne, please take it away. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you. I know everyone's tired at the end of the day for many of you. So, um, thank you for, for joining. I'm going to share a screen. And um, this is going to be a hands-on workshop, but I'm just going to preface a little bit. Uh, bef whoops, before we get into, um, whoops, I think I need to be have sharing, participant sharing. So we're going to be talking about millifluidics, uh, which is a way to kind of introduce the concepts of microfluidics. So I'm trying to get access to the slide share. Okay, while we're waiting for the slide share to be enabled, I'm going to show you the materials you should have with you. So when I start presenting, if you don't have it with you, you can go get some of them. So I'm going to just use this little uh, document projector. This one here. And some materials you're going to want for today's workshop are going to be two small containers with some pipettes. You can see that. Um, I have food coloring here, but we're also going to be talking about using uh, lemons and baking soda because you have the option if you have pH strips to use those. You're going to want a pair of scissors, a thing of tape, some wax paper, a coffee filter. So these are some laser cut coffee filter pieces I've already have, but we're going to cut our shapes today since we can't be in person. Uh, if we were in person, I would have provided these little, these little shapes here. Um, so that's pretty much it in terms of the materials. And we will go over this some more as we move along. Let's move this back down. And let me see if I can share a screen now. Nope, I'm still disabled. <laughs> I'm going to put some links into the chat then. No, so. no, Corinne, apologies. Uh, I can give you... It's cool. Let me That's just confess. Fault. You should be able to share your screen now. Apologies. Okay. No worries. Let me, um, okay. Uh, one second. Okay. Bring my slides to the front. Uh, looks like there's six people in the waiting room. Um, Okay, cool. I found my slide deck. Sure. Okay, cool. Let me begin to present mode. Okay. Okay. And I hope, hope you guys can all see that. So what we're going to be discussing today and exploring hands-on is a very simple pathway to get into a conversation about microfluidics and uh, lab on the chip kind of conversations with the general public. So there's a lot of innovation happening in Google Science uh, in terms of creating tools and pathways into these conversations about microfluidics. But not many people are in the conversation right now. So how do we bring these conversations to more people who, whom it might be really important? So for example, I am in California and I work at East San Jose and Salinas and there are a lot of uh, f quality, air quality, soil quality, f food, water, there's a lot of issues. And it'd be really great if we could create activities where engage people in conversations about what they wanna see done. What, are they, what do they want to explore and how would they design testing tools? So I think the conversation about actually designing tools needs to be carried into communities. So it's not just tools being brought to them, but giving them the opportunity to think about what tools they might need. Um, and just as a really uh, timely example, in, in Salinas right now, your ag workers are three times more likely to catch COVID. And then we had the fires and the air quality 
and they weren't getting masks. And uh, even today, they have to provide their own PPE, even though um, some is being given to the different ag commissioners in the different counties. But how might we enable people to test themselves, their air, their soil, or water? Um, do these conversations, we need to have access to the conversation. And so what I'm really interested in is using very familiar materials that don't seem precious, that invite people to iterate so they can start doing design explorations themselves. So when we lower the, the cost of the materials we're exploring with, we're lowering the barrier to the conversation and also increasing, increasing iteration. So this is a project journey we're gonna go on. I started exploring this last November and um, I've done it multiple times in different communities as I refine the project. So I think most of you probably are familiar with what micro, microfluidics are. We're gonna do uh, millifluidics, a um, little bit bigger scale. And I have found that this is a really great conversation to have with people, not just the idea of what is passive capillary uh, flow, but just people have an experience of using a pipette hands-on I have discovered that people, that's magic to them. So some of the tools that you all use, it's new and it's magic. And to them, it adds like a real bit of science into the explorations. The other thing I highly recommend is getting these like little mini containers for your uh, beakers. These are also magic. When you scale things down to become more accessible and more playful. I'm not gonna go into the deep explanation of microfluidics. I, I don't in my presentations either with families and communities. So when I do these workshops, um, they're in community settings uh, with multi-generational communities. And then coming up soon, we're actually sending out kits. So in this time of COVID, hands-on science is really hard with students. We're sending out 50 of these kits in collaboration. I'm working with um, Shinampa and the Tech Interactive. We're sending these out to low resource youth, uh, both in East San Jose through a food a community garden and through the migrant ed program in Monterey County. So these kits with these microfluidics are going straight to the youth whose parents work in the field and who themselves actually work in the fields too. So in the United States, I don't know if you know or are aware, uh, you can be as young as 12 years old and picking food in our fields. You just need, there's a certain permission you need to get from um, your parents and the parents have to be in that same field. So these are the people who are like, experiencing pesticides, fires, um, unnecessary exposure to COVID, who should be in the conversation about designing the tools that they need in their environment and what would they choose to design. So that's what drives this conversation that we're going into. The other thing I think is really amazing about my millifluidics and microfluidics is the design of the pathways actually are determined function. So I like to always highlight this one on the right with it looks kind of like a snail with the antenna how that particular design separates by size. So if you were doing a fluid sample of the air, then this is also something that surprises people that air is a fluid, um, you could separate heavier particles, they go to the inside track on this here. Um, there's other ones that mix. So talking about mixing and separating, uh, I think is a really uh, great conversation to have. And then explaining and having conversations about why, why is it so magical? Why are microfluidics important? Well, you're decreasing the cost in so many ways. The cost of the reagents, the time to conduct an experiment, and um, just access. Another thing that inspired the project was seeing this project called Soil Cards. And so this, you know, tests the phosphates and the pH and the nitrogen and the potassium in the soil. And it's very accessible and hands-on and uses not the big bottles and the, what you usually go out there and do a test with. How can we bring microfluidics into a conversation on paper as well. So a couple years ago, my daughter did an internship at a company, SE3D, that was doing 3D printed uh, microfluidics, and it was really cool and accessible if you had a computer and if you had their tools. So, um, and it was wonderful. It was at uh, BioCurious. So this is a startup that was, had a, a space there and was offering some internships. So I saw this and thought, this is such a great conversation to have. How do we lower that barrier? So now I'm gonna just show a few images and then we're gonna go into the activity itself. Thank you for your patience. I just wanna show how this is play and it's with community and there's no wrong or right answer when you're starting to make these tracks. It's experimental. And there's a little boy on the right. He's 
uh, Pinky's in preschool. Um, and then the woman on the left, our teen, you can see she got really excited about color mixing on the coffee filter itself. Like, there's other journeys to have here. And I'm not going to tell people, oh, no, you know, get your pet pet and work on your track. No, have fun. Experiment with that coffee filter. That's learning there as well. Um, I think we need to create these creative spaces where people can experiment and play as they're learning these concepts, these higher level concepts. So a lot of time in education, you hear the term low floor, high ceiling. I'm really interested in that low floor access, the low floor of using simple materials. And then others with much more experience and knowledge can take that to the higher level into actual microfluidics. But to have the public familiar and comfortable and excited about the science, I think is really important. I want to show these images here because these are uh, laser cut designs that are taken or inspired by Nazca lines in Peru. So some, some scientists uh, believe that those are macrofluidics, that those giant Nazca lines that you can only see from the, the forms from high in the sky were fluid channels. They may not have been, um, but they obviously, these were experts in Peru that knew how to get water from the mountains all the way to the dry desert area. So perhaps those other channels that they did design specifically for water influenced us. And so bringing culture into conversation when, when we play, when we make, highlights to people that their culture has science and has innovation. And I'm just gonna, I just love these two slides because it's play with pipettes. Uh, people love these. It's not something you have in your normal life for your average person. I also had the, um, some teens help me uh, these are the GIY bio buddies, and they also were in uh, my biojam camp at Stanford. Um, but so much of what we do with science communication is, is I believe, developing next leaders, um, playful leaders that can share journeys and develop journeys with others. So I just, this was at a holiday fair, at a, a craft fair. So where are the spaces we do science? They can be in community spaces. Uh, I think people just came and sat down because they were tired not because they wanted to learn anything about fluidics. <laughs> and what we had was colorful. So in this case, we only used food coloring and they walked away with a, a tree ornament or a bookmark. So, but it was an entry point conversation. We're about to start the project, but the project here, I'm showing you um, the next iteration of all this. Um, this project started with packing tape and it was a little awkward. I had to create mounting devices. Then it moved to having plastic backing and now we're using, um, we're using this wax paper. Um, so even when we're designing simple projects, there's iteration in that. And so these are the kit, this is a project that is, has a kit that are gonna go out to youth. Um, so now I'm gonna stop sharing screen and we're gonna go into how to do that. I, I'm sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat. So yeah, NASCA lines is amazing, I agree. Okay, so our very first step is um, you're going to want to, if you have it in front of you, uh, a coffee filter. So I don't know if you all have this, but if you do, this is the next step. And what you're going to do is you're going to draw um, some shapes on it. I've drawn some on here. And our process is, I'm kind of old, I am old. <laughs> so I remember Hot Wheel cars. I don't know how many of you, and I'm American, so that may not be a great metaphor. But we had these toys growing up that um, were car tracks that you could piece together and then run cars along. So I think of this as putting together toy car tracks where you have multiple forms. Um, and the way that I distribute these, oh, the lighting is really bad, is I put them in a Petri dish and they're already pre-laser cut and they get to, people get to experiment Laying these down in a form, okay? Yeah, real train track. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what other, other metaphor would work there? Yes. So the next step is to actually cut out that track. So I'm going to do that right now. So if you want to take a moment, if you have um, your coffee filter paper, and if you don't, that's fine. I'm going to put my little thing back up, and I'm going to put different. Okay, so I've just done a couple shapes here. Let me move my chair. Okay, so I'm just going to um, cut these out. Okay. 
And so with this really simple, like this is not, these aren't any materials that people do not, oops, sorry, people do not already have. So I think whenever we can explore bringing kind of higher science concepts using really simple materials, I think the ideas stick. At least they do for me. So I have to tell you, I'm, I am an artist. I'm not a scientist. Um, so my ignorance is like, uh, helpful, <laughs> helpful because I know how to, how to introduce ideas from a very novice perspective. I'm sorry, I keep going off camera here. I'm both looking at the screen and cutting out my odd little shape. Okay, so we're gonna make this like a cooking show because I'm gonna swap to the shape already cut out. <laughs> All right, and normally I would have a second shape. So let's just say this is my other shape that I've cut out. And so then what I invite people to do This one's kind of, is to figure out how they're gonna connect. So I have all these forms here. How might I connect these? Now there's also ways that you see 3D microfluidics where you can have a separation on top of each other. You can actually layer over. Um, you can actually do that with these as well. So you can have different levels to your um, fluidics track. In this, in this case, you would just put um, uh, a barrier of plastic uh, tape between, the, between the, the different levels. So the next step. Now, normally in the project that I'm doing right now, um, students would be receiving a laser cut piece of paper, wax paper that has tape on it that's been laser cut to have ports. So let me just show you what those look like. Okay. So here's an example. Just to make it easier, because otherwise, let me show you what we're going to be doing. I actually have a video of this done by a student where they're using a mat knife to cut the tape ports. Okay. But in this case, what we're going to do instead is we're going to overlap and then we're going to take regular tape. And this orange is going to represent the regular tape because you, you wouldn't be able to see it here. But we would start with taping down over the ports so that there's access to that coffee filter. Okay, so I'm going to show you the example of that. So this already has tape on it. Oh, let's see if I can pitch this light. Maybe this is better. Let me turn this off for a second, see if this works better. I think that's better. Um, so where these pink squares are, is where I've taken clear tape and made this square port by cutting the tape into small narrow strips. I'm just gonna show you here. Maybe you can see that. Then using it to create only access there. Okay, so let me just share screen one more time. So you can see how this process is done via the instructions. So here's a material list section. So students can visually see this. Um, most people might have baking soda and lemon and water. These other materials come in the kit. And then on the right is where um, they're invited to assemble their tracks. And these are all based, are mostly based on existing microfluidics tracks. And then the next step is to do what I just started doing. For the students, it's easier because they're just peeling it off like a sticker and deciding where their two starting ports are. So in this particular experiment uh, that we're sending out through the Bio Plus Food Plus Tech project, the students are creating two entry ports to drop into. They're creating a secondary port where they're gonna put a pH strip just to see that it's working. So the end result is they're gonna be putting lemon in one side and baking uh, soda in the other. They're gonna mix go down this track, like an intestines. I think it's very intuitive they see this. Um, and then their last port's here, and they also put a pH strip here, okay? Um, they will have the ability to design the port however they want. They don't have to do this pattern. They get, like, I think six different uh, laser cut shapes to assemble for their, their tracks. And uh, then they're going to do what I just was showing, where uh, you, um, well, this part right here is where I'm showing with the, the tape, where you're creating the port 
they don't have to do that, they get the sticker. The next step is to cover the whole, whole uh, uh, device. So I'll show that. My computer will go forward. Um, whoops. Okay, yeah, so this was step one, where you just cut out a few shapes, figure out what you want to design, and then figure out how you're going to assemble it, and know what size paper you're going to put up, what, what's your backing. So in this case, now I'm using wax paper. As before, I said I was using, uh, the step prior to that I was using plastic. And then before that, I was using uh, double uh, packing tape. And that was really difficult because he set it down and it stuck and he couldn't move it. It was like flypaper. And so there was a lot of iteration. I mean, now it seems very obvious, like, why not just start with wax paper? But it took me a while to get to that, that thought process, to that solution. And then here's an example here of creating that port. So if you don't have these laser cut ports, then you can just take small strips of paper, uh, tape to create that uh, port spot. And so again, it starts with the two entry drop ports that you're gonna start from, and then secondary ones, uh, just to make sure that um, it's flowing right, they'll look different if you're using pH strips, and then the mixing one at the bottom. And then now I'm at the step where I'm gonna cover the whole thing. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment so you can see. Um, if we can get it to stop sharing. Okay. I'm going to put this back up here. So I have created um, my ports here at the top, my secondary one. And now I'm going to create, um, cover up the piece. But I'm going to add one more section. And as I mentioned, you can make this kind of 3D. Oh, sorry, the lighting is so bad. Okay. So this one is kind of taped down. I have tape under this little leg here. So when I want to overlap another piece, I actually can just go over it, tape it down. Uh, I'm going to try to get that to look. There you go. So even though it looks like it will bleed straight down this leg, they are separated. So this really speaks to like the 3D microfluidics that you can see um, if you do a search in that. So now I'm going to take my just my regular tape. And I'm gonna cover everything that's not a port. Make sure I don't go over my ports. And that's why I color them in pink, just to make sure I don't put tape over that. Okay. Uh, I tell you, it's nice to stand. If you guys need to stand, stand. And we've been sitting all day. Okay, so I've kind of covered this whole area here uh, with my tape, it's protected. And I'm gonna cover all the way down here. I'm just gonna tape over this. I don't have to cover the whole sheet, just over where the track is. And it's really just to protect it from if I spill. Okay. So now my very last port is just gonna be this here. It's just gonna, it's gonna go through here to here. What's really nice about using um, coffee filters, uh, it's fast, the, the color mixing is pretty quick. So I'm gonna share screen. Yeah, question. Mentality as, as well as um, because if there's no kind of institutional backroom, it's very, very hard to get additional people in, um, kind of involved without uh, following that sort of track. Um, do you have any particular players in mind and or players already committed? I'm sorry, could you ask it one more time? I understand players. What? Sorry. It may be bleed over from another session. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and I'm going to throw in the chat right now some links um, and then I'll keep going. So here's a resource doc that um, might be useful. I know a lot of you guys multitask, so I'm going to throw in a few others. And here's the bio plus food plus tech link I'm going to put in. This is all centered around how do we engage more people um, in these discussions. 
Let me copy. Okay, here's their bio, Pahoo Pahtuk. And here is another one of, of this next one I'm putting in is from Biojam Camp. So both of these team camps or team projects had these kits in it. Um, and then the second one, the Biojam, you'd have you're going to scroll all the way to the bottom of the kit to see that particular activity. And there's also a team created video for um, uh, how you use that. Okay, so now I'll close this doc and go back to the slides. Okay. Share screen real quick. Okay, so then the next step is to invite people to use the materials um, for making doing the mixing. Voices um, and agendas and so on, and also introducing the, the minimum number of players for whom people might have a bad taste in their mouth. Right. Um, <laughs> is that that's from another track, right? Okay, <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah, okay. I think that was Krishna. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, like, how can we design tests that are really simple? So you saw in the images that I shared that food coloring is the simplest thing. That's what you can really visually see. But I think it's really nice to incorporate pH strips and quaternary strips. Uh, once you start using a quaternary, that's like kind of testing for pesticides almost, and you can do a physical track system using soil. Like you can actually put soil into your little design. Um, I have a sample that I could show later. But basically, this is the next step um, where they're going to mix. So it's kind of like a, you know, cooking cooking show where they get to actually mix ingredients. And then this is people's most. This is their favorite part is uh, dropping the the uh, fluids in. But before we get to that, we're going to put on the pH strips. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to put this back on. All right. And I'm sorry to figure out the lighting on this. Uh, I'm in my garage and I'm kind of playing with different lighting options. Okay, so here is a packet of pH strips. I'm just going to take one and, and uh, cut it into smaller pieces. And for people who haven't experimented with this before this is a really great journey too there's so many parts of this that you all as, as science explorers uh for many years you just take for, for granted but many people have not had that hands-on experience with these materials or if they did they were like i don't know in high school for one project and that's another thing i want to bring up like high school is remote now and even when it wasn't remote access to the science materials is can be very uh, restricted. I remember my daughter telling me in middle school that someone broke one of the microscopes, so the rest of the class was banned from using microscopes the rest of the year. And so these kind of like punitive explorations or, you know, you get very fearful of, of doing something wrong in science. I think we really need to change and find ways to engage people in imagining the future of innovation and technology and science um, through playful means. Um, I'm currently in the class, at, uh, an open class at Stanford um, in the Prakash lab, and it's called Frugal Science. And one thing he told us, so it's half Stanford students, so they're either PhDs or undergrads, and then the other half are global citizens, people who applied, who are interested in, in frugal science and developing uh, accessible tools. Uh, it includes youth and, and adults. and he was telling us how, and I didn't know this, and you all probably know it, but that um, pH was de is developed from a lichen, and I didn't know that, a ground up lichen. I thought that was really interesting. It's not a connection to nature. So um, this is the completed system. And now I'm going to go, I'm going to be risky and put some liquids on my keyboard. <laughs> so this is the next step. Um, I'm going to move these off and bring over my liquids. All right, here's my little thing of water. Here's my lemon juice, and I add a little bit more to that. And this is going to be the baking soda. Okay. 
So first step is um, I'm going to create. Oh, I'm really having a hard time with this. It's upside down. Refresh the other thing. Okay. So lemon is going to go in here. And I think you know pretty much any citrus fruit will do. I don't really need that much. This is all I'm going to take. Um, and again, another option is obviously food coloring, but um, since we're doing pH, that's this not going to make more sense. And you guys can you mute yourself. Can you tell me if I have added food coloring, would that change the pH? Because that would be kind of cool to put a color on it. Oh, you know what? It would change what the pH color looks like, the strip. Never mind. Okay, so I'm going to add some uh, baking powder to this. I'm sorry, baking soda. So this is just, it was like a half teaspoon. Um, I want to make it enough of a slurry that it will go through the fluid channel. So I'm going to water it down a bit. And I'm just going to mix it with the pipette. I think it's pretty mixed. Okay, I'm going to take this water off. I'm going to find my second pipette. Here's my second pipette. That's going to go in the lemon. And of course, I will not mix those. I'm going to get my, and this is what a track looks like with just um, with food coloring. I did one with food coloring and a um, strip at the bottom. Okay, so let's get the one that I just finished. Where did it go? Okay, so here we go. And when I do these workshops, um, it's really exciting when the first person does it because it all sort of makes sense to everyone else who, who's still kind of like, hmm, I don't know what this is all about. Um, and they, whoops, I put too many on here. My apology. We needed to have the excuse that's late in the day. I'm just tired <laughs> from yesterday. Okay, so I have my drop port. So this is what I need to keep open. These are my drop ports. So I'm going to put um, the baking soda one on this side. And I just kind of mounded it there. And then I'm going to put the lemon juice one over on this side. And just a bead of lemon juice on that. Okay. And then I'm just going to put a lemon, oops, a marker, permanent marker, lemon, baking soda. And then at the end, you can see what happens. So you can see the lemon juice has already come through here. And usually what it gives everyone is a little graphic uh, for, you know, the color codes for pH. So they, they themselves can figure out what is basic and what is acidic. And um, maybe this one is not pushed down. Oh, there it goes. Just didn't reach that. Okay. And so then it's going to slowly... The liquids will merge here, and then they'll slowly coil through here, and then they'll end up there. And so um, people will kind of continue to add liquid on top just to see it move through the track. And it's much more visible when you're using food coloring. So that's something to think about if you're working with uh, large groups of people uh, and youth. That might be a, a better pathway. Um, but I think it's good to do both. Uh, oh, food coloring. Yeah, go do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to add some more food coloring to this one here, too. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping I can open this without, like, spilling it everywhere. Let me see if I can. Okay, so I'm going to flip that. Um, and actually, let's do a new one. I'm just going to tape one down really fast. So we'll just set this here. See if it moves all the way down to here. That's where I'm supposed to put it. Oh my goodness. So it's supposed to go here. Yeah, it's already it's already got there. So let me take this down. So as you can see, it's the liquid is traveling. And I'll be interested to see if it actually throughout this time that we're here, uh, if it'll reach. And so that that bit, there was only a tiny hole right there, but it immediately contacted with the paper. And so now the only way it has to travel through something that can um, the, through the coffee filter, which has Greater capillary action. The wax paper is, uh, you know, not not going to absorb it. Make sure I put a little bit more in here. Okay, cool. 
All right, so now let's do one with food coloring. And in this case, um, I'll loosely take this down. I'm going to do two ports. I'm going to add this one on. And let's see what this does. The really nice thing about exploring um, millifluidics too with this kind of very simple material, you will get people wanting to do more than one experiment. And I think that's really the goal because science is not about doing something once. Can you get a few more pipettes? So I've got a whole little container of these. Oh, also, I don't recommend using these little syringes because they really squirt out, unless you've got a really nice, smooth pump action. These are so much better for people to play with, just if, if you have a lot more control. I get mine at the Japanese Daiso store. They also have these accordion ones that people really like. So different kind of like kinetic ways of interacting with your tools or di having different tool options, I think is really great. Okay, so I'm just gonna add um, some coloring here, and some here. We'll see if that moves. Um, I also think using the colored coffee filters works better, just because it's easier to see. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to demo with the, the white one. So I'm just realizing that now that the natural, uh, especially if you're doing this online, you know, if you're doing it virtually and you send out kits, um, go with the natural ones because then people can see that better unless you have like really the perfect lighting. Okay, so now I'm going to move back to the slides real quick. Um, any, okay, let me look at the chat, we'll see. Not all food coloring has alcohol. Hey, Patrick, does food coloring usually have alcohol? I think some of them do, but I think most of the brands you get in the supermarkets don't. Because that makes them more child child yeah. shape. Okay. And wow. I know we've uh, used food coloring in uh, cell cultures where alcohol might be an issue. Okay. Um, before I share screen again, and you, you can't see what I'm doing, uh, I can see that. Any, other, any other thoughts right now? Any comments? I'm going to share um, screen again. Just All right, I'm going to share screen, and then I'll come right back to the see to be able to see the chat. Okay, so we did this, actually put ports in the top ones as well earlier. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but this is uh, a, a graphical way of, of sharing information, especially when we're working with people who speak multi, uh, different languages other than English. So some of the students that I work with, uh, Spanish is even their second language. So the first language is an indigenous Mexican language. Um, if we're talking about migrant youth and uh, in the Salinas area, I'm talking about Gonzales and Chualar and Greenfield. Many of these children are um, children of migrant workers who are from, uh, who are indigenous. Um, they speak the primary language is indigenous. So it's really good to really think about how you're sharing visually in a way that's accessible. Oops. Okay, and this is what I just did. I just dropped uh, the, the fluids into the ports and then they reached the, the kind of testing spots right there. Um, I have another mixing spot here, and then on mine, I've got one right down at the bottom as well. Okay, the next one. And so just invite people to watch Liquid Move and, um, and then take a picture and share to Instagram. Now, a lot of our students don't have Instagram, obviously, so um, we work with uh, distribution hubs that are either the community, farm groups, um, after school education, uh, and migrant ed. And uh, they are partners that share with the students, like, you know, share any way you can. We're only putting this in here uh, to kind of start experimenting ways that maybe we can share on social media. Um, and this is showing a, a pathway of using just the food coloring. 
Uh, I, this is one a pathway that's I think really fun for people. And this is oh this is an example of my very first attempt at this. So you uh, I had to preload these um, mounting devices, which I guess what I call them. I laser cut them and I put packing tape down face up. So think of flypaper. And so it's a sticky flypaper. And imagine having like a hall full of families and you have to lay these out on the table so they're not touching each other. Like it was so hard. And then they take this sticky flypaper mounting thing and put the tracks on it, line it up just right, and then put another layer on top. And then they took the mat knife and cut the ports. So that was the pathway for this one. Uh, and it worked, but you know, it was clear that there was a uh, opportunity to improve that, that, that doing the flypaper thing was not, not ideal. Um, and this is more on the Nazca line. So uh, I always like to share this with students because I don't know how much they get of this in high school and middle school. And if they do, they just fly by it. But um, I also share the, the link that's down here so they can read more about the incredible uh, uh, you know, water management systems that we have in desert communities around the world and specifically this, this community here. Um, and this is a task with soil. So this is fun, like a student mixed dirt with um, some water and then um, did the um, pH, and I think this one's a quaternary strip, but just like starting these conversations with other materials, um, other things in the environment. So I'm gonna exit this. Um, I'm trying to stop sharing. And then let's go see how this, uh, the laminar, yeah, Nazca lines are just awesome. Mesofluidics, yeah, I, I think it's also like, um, what do you call it? Megafluidics, I know metafluidics is already taken. So if you haven't looked at metafluidics fluidics yet, please look at that site. That's David Kong's MIT site. And I didn't learn about it until after I already started making all these little coffee filter designs. Um, but those are, those are really cool. Um, that's amazing. When I, I talked earlier about um, low, low uh, floor, high ceiling, that's a high ceiling site where you can go and find these multiple tracks, uh, 3D print them, you know, using um, different techniques than this, obviously, and do microfluidics. So that's where really this physics makes sense, is when you get to the micro scale. Um, and you can see, uh, it's hard to see here, but this fluid's already going this way. On this one, you can already see the fluids are starting to go down. And just having the time to go through a project with people where they can sit for quite a while, and they keep adding liquids, and like, start one and then make another one and revisit the one they just started like kind of caretaking this this device uh is a really fun journey and so that's kind of all i have to show in terms of the step by steps um again it's very simple materials uh i think the magic is go in going with any science experiment with community um, again, I design these for multi-generational activities. Go with little miniature stuff. It's so fun for people. And think about the tools you use it, that you think are normal, but like to lay people like me, like they're so fun and magic. And especially like, they should hire me at Daiso. Like I love all their, <laughs> look how beautiful and fun these little pipettes are with a little, you know, pump action. So um, making science fun and, and engaging, broader demographics into the innovation conversations. Like there's so few people that know what microfluidics are. I think this group, it's like everyone knows, right? But if you just talk to general people, they don't, and then they can't dream. Dream of like how it might have applications like in wearable sensors uh, in their world. Let me see this back here. Um, yeah, imagine pipette is magic wand. <laughs> totally, I thought that was a huge one. Okay, so I know there's a lot of people here who have like a lot of experience with tool design and innovation design and microfluid. microfluid. I'd love for you all to share your thoughts um, or any points that I missed in this conversation about like possible engagement. I'm gonna call some people. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, go. Have you tried a laminator? Is that something you've, you've thought of? Uh, no, I, you know, I've seen other people, have, oh gosh, um, Chitam Bio, I think mentioned that. And they, they also do one with a, a printer you can do, like a laser printer you can do some fluidic stuff with. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I haven't used a laminator. I kind of want to, 
I don't want to, I work with big groups and I don't want to have to come to one central table to lose, use a laminator, but yeah. it might be a good pathway. You can get one for like 20 bucks or something. Yeah. Maybe put one on each table. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that might work. I mean, yeah, that would work. Right. Um, other thoughts. Um, I have some other examples to share, but yeah. Any other thoughts? Nanofluidics on the other side. Ooh, David, can you speak to that? Shrinky dink, yes, shrinky, people do that. People do shrinky dinks. Mm -hmm. Wow, plastic and a heat gun, yes, that actually does work. I've seen that. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna um, bring up some links to share with you of other designs. Like I've seen people do uh, laser cut um, microfluidics. Let me see if I can find that. Um, accidentally close the dock, I didn't want to. But there's a lot of different ways that this could be possible to share with um, communities. And, and I think the great challenge of doing uh, accessible tools like it's how do we design things that uh, can both be universal and hyper local like people get interested in things when it has app has applications to their lives um, and so putting the, the R&D into their hands can really drive innovation I think um, so let me just find that so sorry, I actually closed the screen and um, I'm like digging for it now. Um, I'm wondering if there's other strip tests, that, like other um, reagents that can be used and like pH are very easy to get a hold of. Uh, so are quaternary strips. Um, I'm wondering if people have other ideas on, um, okay, so here, I'm gonna share this one. Red, yeah, cabbage juice, exactly. So yeah, so you can, cabbage is a great pH um, device. Okay, so let me, this is real quick. Sorry, I'm gonna share screen, just trying to find the right one. Okay, here, cool. Okay. I don't know why sometimes when you have multiple screens, it can't find the right one. Okay, so this is really cool, wood microfluidics. So um, I haven't tried this. But it's one of the links in my doc that I shared at the beginning, and I'll, I'll share that again. Um, but this is a cool pathway too. What are the ways that we can create these tiny channels that can carry very small amounts of liquids? And then what are the reagents, right? And, and what are you testing for? What could we test for? Um, and then another one that we could look at. Um, I'm going to share soil, soil cards again. I think this one is really, really inspiring. Um, this is from a group, I believe, I think it's in, in England. Um, but I think this is really important conversation to have because if we can design these low cost tools, might people design tools to test their own health as opposed to the soil? So right now, the people in the conversation about testing soil nutrients are gonna be farmers. And in the United States, they're all the mega farmers. <laughs> but what if we put this, these, these uh, tools into the hands of the actual workers. Uh, not necessarily the tools, but the, the ability to design their own tools. Would they be testing, would they be designing wearable tools that test for pesticide exposure? Would, would they be designing tools that can test for COVID in their carpools that go to the fields or at the food trucks that come to visit the fields? What are the systems that they live within that they would want to add um, systems testing, environmental testing. Um, so I think something like this um, really opens up the conversation when it's really accessible uh, for other people to engage in those, those conversations. Okay. Um, I, I, all the, I'm just gonna put the, that document, that resource doc in the link. I don't wanna keep talking. Um, and I know everyone's tired. So um, let me just grab this doc for people who came a little later. And I'm going to show how that, that device is going right now. Um, so let me just throw this in the chat. I think if you came later, you don't see it. Um, here we go. 
hand, I'm just going to grab. Yeah, it's moving. I'll hold it. Well, I can't hold it up. I'll just put this up here. Oh, yeah, it moved a lot. Okay, so the first one actually. Okay, so this one is the second one I did, and you can see uh, that the yellow's moved a lot, the blue hasn't. Not sure why, but this one that I started off with, it's got the way. It reached all the way to the bottom. So it, it traveled through these, through this mixing one, it traveled around and down onto that track at the bottom. So what was that? It was like half an hour, I think. Um, yeah, we demanded synchronization, Patrick. So yeah, exactly. Patrick, when you workshops, I mean, don't you feel like that's a challenge when you're doing science and bio? Absolutely. <laughs> Some waiting involved. <laughs> that's why you can do the here's work. Here's one that I made earlier. <laughs> yeah, but this was pretty quick and it's, you know, low floor, but I think that's like one of the yeah, huge this pressure is, points. This is much faster than most things in science. Yeah. Um, so I put the resource doc in there. Um, it has links to, I think, everything, including the slide deck. I'll double check after this. And I know I have 15 more minutes, but I just want to open it up to any questions or comments because this is kind of where it's, where I've, I've got it. I've kind of gone through everything in this particular. Let me see. Um, I'm going to share one last thing. So this kit was designed to support a conversation about ag tech, biotech, and food safety of uh, food systems. So I'm just going to go to that real quick and share that site. I'll move this off my. I need to scroll this at some point. Okay. So um, let me share a screen real quick. Okay, share. I'm going to go to bio. It's food tech. Okay. So this is what um, Shinampa and the tech has just launched. We're starting to send out, deliver the kits to different, different um, organizations. And it's designed for teens. And it was co-created with uh, the support and beta testing of teens in our BioJam program, which is a, um, a pilot program in the Stanford Bioengineering that's specifically for teens to get them to think about how they would design science communication programming. Um, so they support us by being beta testers. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're having, so I'll show you the kit page first. We're sending out, we'll go to that page. Yeah, so here's what's in the activity kit that I held up earlier. Um, so we have it in English and Spanish. Um, ideally, we would have it in three additional indigenous languages, but we didn't have time. So basically, we were kind of starting with these questions, these kind of larger questions. And this is something to think about too, like what, what are the, it's cool to have these projects, but you know, how do we get it to connect with people? So inviting people to kind of in a cartoon way, share where they think biotech might be in their lives, where ag tech might be, to have them imagine. Um, you can all see this on, you can go to the site and see these, but inviting people to sketch the ideas and make it clear that there's no wrong or right or wrong answer. Starting with that, I think it's a good place to start. And then these are our stakeholder cards. So we're asking teens to think about who in their community needs to be in these conversations more. So we're talking about ag tech, you know, food systems design, and biotech. Who is not in the conversation or who needs to be more in the conversation? And to hear from the youth themselves from these communities, um, I think it's going to be really useful for uh, the out-of-school education programming groups that we work with. Because then we can share with them what the team said. Are we going to get 50 cards back that say, uh, we think the factory owner needs to have more of a voice. No, we're not. We're going to get a mix of these other ones. And to be honest, in wise communities, uh, the community farm organizers are really important because they do a lot of programming with youth. Um, and also the field workers. I mean, these are both the teens we're reaching out to, as well as their parents and grandparents. Um, so just... We, we threw in the factory owner because, you know, you got to have all the variables down there as much. And then this is another thing we put in here as a, a blank card. Like, who is not here that needs to be a part that we, maybe we're not thinking about? And then at the bottom is this information on the, the fluidics. And uh, these are some of the images. And again, we're not using these um, 
pump ones, we're using the Daiso version of um, the pipettes, or kind of similar ones. Um, and so making these simple journeys be part of these like bigger conversations, I think is really important. And then the last thing I wanted to share is uh, in this time of COVID, I'm gonna open up the mirror board. This is where our conversation is happening. We're having asynchronous conversations with these teams. We have a mirror board where they can go and explore and share their ideas on these different topics. And we're making it on a mirror board because it's asynchronous. A lot of teams we work with live in multifamily house households. So even if they got a tool, uh, a, a computer from their, their um, school district, they may not have a quiet spot to sign in and be on Zoom and talk. So we invite them to come to this page where it's very clear to them that the preference isn't that they be synchronous, but it's to be playfully asynchronous. So they sign, I'll zoom out, but they sign in here on a Google Doc, and then they pick an emoji to represent themselves. Open up the map so you can see this better. And then they write their name next to it. I was being very ambitious to put a lot of emojis here, but they can choose what they want. So if you can see Isabella here, uh, T's chose a dolphin, Anne chose a potato, uh, Emily's a snail. Um, zoom out. Go to the next board. And then we have these sliders where they are adding their thoughts on different questions. So bio is, a, is short for biotechnology. Um, where do you land on these different sliders? Um, I won't go through the whole thing. You can see the links. We also created, so everyone has its own little emoji stickers where they can put their ideas on food systems. And then this is a really important part where they add their thoughts and sticky notes um, about what they think is important. Um, yeah, so why they'd want to know about a particular section. And so this is a way we're communicating. Um, and this is important because if you're working with communities that don't have really great internet access, it's great to work with a playful tool that clearly shows them that um, you value, uh, even if they can get on um, at a different time, not all in a synchronous Zoom time. I think that's it. Any any questions? Oh, what are the ages of the kids? Um, teens. So um, uh, high school students, and we do have middle school. So I actually work with middle school students through high school students. So in East San Jose, I work with middle school students in the summer program. Didn't happen this year. Um, but then I have the high school one that was asynchronous this year um, that ran through Stanford and then uh, also in Salinas. Um, yeah, Betty, I see we've got 15 minutes. Um, any other questions? Oh, and I um, just want to share too that this kit that I'm working with um, for Shinampa and uh, with Anya Schultz of the Tech Interactive, this is part of a national PIT program, Public Interest Technology Community Innovation Program. And it's just an interesting concept because what they did, it's a pilot program. They invited um, museum institutions from across the United States to apply, but they had to apply with a partnering community organization body or another organizational body. Um, and so the tech partnered with Shinampa because we were interested in how do we reach these lower resource students that normally aren't in these conversations. Migrant ed students, students that uh, are in Ali South Salinas, um, where you know 80% of the population speaks Spanish and you know, the youth are mostly bilingual, but the parents maybe didn't go to go further than high school. So how do we get them into these conversations? They have great ideas and they have expertise. They have expertise in agriculture. So one, and one more thing I would like to say, oh, thanks, I'm glad you like the kits. Um, I will share the, um, the files so you can laser cut the, the cool little really fluidics tracks. Um, one other thing I want to share is that we, in the United States, only 2% of the population is involved in food production. So if you think about that, um, we, there's a huge opportunity to inform and engage, right? 2%, we're pretty disconnected. Most of us go to the grocery store and that's, you know, we don't really think much more than that. But um, it's important for the rest of us to be thinking about that 2% and how can we reimagine food production and how can we make it safer for that 2% who do the food production? Uh, this, it's a huge industry in the Salinas, Monterey County, billions of dollars. It's the salad bowl of the world. And yet, the equity and access conversation, which I think these will hopefully 
start driving it into community programming, that question hasn't been asked. And I just also wanted to share that I come from an ag family. My father's family, just one generation removed from a sugarcane plantation. I didn't get to meet some of my family because they died of crazy different cancers, right? So cane sugar is a slash and burn crop. And um, we can't, no one can really prove that's what caused a lot of people to die um, young. But if we had the data, data is story. Right, so if we had these microfluidics tools that people could design um, that are of value to them, then they could tell the story of what's happening in their community, right? Um, another thing is my father's first memory is pushing a little stool up to his kitchen sink, probably three, and turning on the faucet at the kitchen sink and just poking at it because it had a Bull Durham tobacco bag tight over it. These little tobacco bags were used for everything. Um, it was the filter. They had open trench water on their plantation house. And he would poke at it because it's a little insect leg. So it was like this little toy to him. It's this dangling little bag with legs sticking out of it. And he would just poke at it and watch the legs wiggle because the insects were still alive. And then if he got caught by his grandma or his mom, they would take the bag off, dump it in trash, turn it inside out, and tie it back onto the faucet. And so even as a child, when I heard this story, I thought it was sad that this was his water. Um, I was stunned to hear from some of the um, uh, agricultural right workers that we work with at Chinampa that that still happens. So if you look at Imperial Valley in California, there are areas where field workers, where the workers uh, have to provide their own water. It's not guaranteed, they have to pay for it. So what they do is they tap into the open trench water that are in the fields and pipe it to their house. And it's the exact same thing that my father had in the 40s. So these stories um, are stories from the past and are from the present. And how can we design tools that, that change that story and track the data uh, that enable people maybe to test that there's E. coli uh, in their faucets, which was done and they found out crazy levels of E. coli in those, those jerry-rigged water um, systems in the, in the Imperial Valley. Oh yeah, Jessica, you wanna share that? What you just said in the chat? Yeah, I grew up um, in Western New York near the Tuscarora Indian Reservation, and there was a large percentage of my high school that did not have running water in the 80s. And yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. they had, you know, buckets and wells that they would pump, and you mm -hmm. hope that they're being tested regularly, but probably not. Yeah, I think that's it's such a huge issue. Um, I have my mom's side from the Deep South, and they had, many of them had wells and Tennessee and hope they're tested, right? Same thing, it's a private water source. Um, okay, so Muhammad, do you wanna share? Are you still here, Muhammad? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I am also working on some of, some of the kids in Pakistan and I am working on the, you know what, uh, some uh, some of the laser cuts. So I also want to learn uh, learn from you basically that uh, what sort of application that we can uh, have uh, on it. Actually, I am very new in this field. That's why I, I have the question. I have mentioned it earlier. I'm really new too, so we we'll learn together. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. What are the applications? So, you know, this is about fluid, fluid testing, right? So what are fluids? It could be air, it could be what's in the soil, it could be what's in the food. So I think the driving question is, what does your community want to test? And then how could you drive your designing towards that? How can you engage community driving? Um, and yeah, so I would love to talk with you more. And then I see David has a question. Oh yeah, Patrick, thanks. Whoops. Hey, Corinne. <laughs> um, I've been in and out, so I apologize if I if I missed uh, this earlier. But um, one, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this amazing workshop. Um, you know, it's not something that I talk a lot about at BioSummit, but you know, obviously, I I, I love uh, microfluidics so much. It's been a big part of my life for a very long time. Um, I see you've got Krishna in the room, and I see you've also got Joseph and Barry, of course. So um, you know, we like I think Metafluidics would love to collaborate with you in a, in a more profound way and figure out how to um, really enable the work you're doing. I think. Um, you know, obviously, uh, metafluidics is is the whole vision and, and uh, kind of purpose of that is to try to make metafluidics as 
open source and as, as accessible as possible. And so it'd be cool to figure out a way to collaborate and maybe, um, you know, Krishna is working on this uh, open source design tool as well for, micro, for, uh, for microfluidics. So there could be some really neat ways that we could all work together and, um, and yeah, really try to make an impact for the communities that you're working with. That would be amazing. And I tried to throw that in the chat, but I threw it into a private message to Betty. So thank you for putting it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you along cool. the same lines. Um, and David, I just want to let you all know that um, uh, I reference user resource uh, Metafluidics in all the workshops I do because I think um, it was so magical when when uh, Rolando Perez told me about Metafluidics. It was I'd already started doing these little paper um, millifluidics and I didn't know it existed. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's this high level thing and it's so cool and it's exactly what like I would dream that there would be. Um, so I just, I want to thank you all for that. Cause it was, it was magical when I just, when it was shown to me. So I just thought of a, of a super easy thing that we can do. And, and I bet, you know, Joseph could help with this potentially. We should make a, we should curate a collection of like the parts from your community. That would be like a really simple thing to do to like feature, feature on the site. Um, that's like kind of the top banner. Like when you come down that we have a whole set of collections. Um, and so that would be, that would be super cool. You could even do a few collections that could be different, um, either from different, you know, kind of community different communities that we're working with, or they could be application sorted by application or, or something like that. I think that would be, that would be really, really neat. I think that'd be super fun. It'd be very easy, super easy to do too. Yeah. Hey, Mohammed, you want to, want to collaborate? You and I really knew. So let's do it. You guys should do it. Yeah. If yeah. You, seriously, if you reach out to um, Barry and Joseph, we can, we can make that happen very easily. Just, we can just figure okay. out like kind of what we want the collection to look like. And then, um, yeah. You know, because it could be a collection that is like um, specific to, um, um, you know, the types of devices you guys are making for your application. But then you could even come up with some that might be a little bit more application focused. That could be like, um, 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 you know, for either, either uh, um, and I apologize, I'm not sure exactly which applications you're focusing on here in, in the workshop. But you could also have it be like something that's a little bit more um, general that other people could add to as well. I saw, I, I took some videos, by the way, I've been like taking videos of like the, of you, of you, of you doing some of the things, but I didn't have the audio turned on. So, oh, so you already saw the little, little I mean, this is so low. This is like, so, um, the lighting is not great. Uh, maybe oh no, but, but those are, those are amazing. Those are amazing. I mean, those are like, we, we're in the, in the workshop we had last night. Um, this is what that, yeah, this is, this is amazing. This is, <laughs> well, cause it's, it's, this is the most accessible stuff. You know, who's yeah. got like a clean room, who's got like, you know, PDMS and glass slides and all that stuff. I mean, this is, this is the way to get into it. I mean, this, what you're doing is, is I think is, is so critically important. So. I don't know if you're here, David, but like, I think that like the magic sauce is actually like mini, mini, mini beakers. <laughs> 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 totally totally yeah and like oh and also like mini funnels like things that are like so normal to you all like it's magic to people and many people have never used a pipette i've had people just like squirt everything out and like oh shoot I'm like that's fine make another one you will never do that yeah. again right um exactly. but like just the experience of using ph so I've, I've used ph and quaternary strips quaternary to, to kind of represent pesticides you know mm. um and, and um actually putting soil on these tools as well and then using Nazca line patterns, I don't know if you were here for that, but using cultural um, tracks design. By the way, um, so just for everybody, so everybody knows, um, you know, Corinne has been like working with us, just like working, just doing an unbelievable job, like helping to organize so many different aspects of Biosummit over the past bunch of weeks. And she always takes her meetings in this in this exact room. And this is my first time seeing you, Corinne, actually doing your real like work of the garage lab, like in the garage. <laughs> like I always think about this as like Corinne's office, but it's actually like, you know, seeing your lab in action is like badass. It's so I'm awesome. calling it a lab. <laughs> oh, it's totally a lab. It's a garage. It's a lab. Um, so oh yes, wrinkled beak. Um, so, you know, since I work with uh, youth in oh, Salinas cool. and, and uh, San Jose and other places like I just think it's so important to bring culture in and the fact that the Nazca lines actually they now believe could refer to um, water systems water tracks See, um, like this would be a great collection for metafluidics like, yeah, you know, like, like a, a collection like this that then other people could add to that like have that actually have um, cultural symbolism yeah. that's awesome we that would be <laughs> such a cool collection that would be such a cool collection so, but yeah, but anyways, we don't have to, we don't have to 
decide right now, but but if you think a few of these different ideas, we can follow up. Um, you know, some combination of Joseph Barry and I can follow up, and we can we can get that going. Um, and what's great about it too is if you see it, like I've I've actually never seen that before. Like like uh, you know, fluidic devices that actually have like a cultural or um, other type of symbolism or representation. And you know, if other people see that, then it just inspires them to think differently about. And this actually goes back to so many of the conversations we've been having at Biosummit period about, you know, who are the people making the technologies and, and what's the context in which the technology gets made. This goes back to even some of Drew's comments last night. And, you know, I, I, one of a, I love the Emboa lab. I don't know if you guys have met Thomas Emboa. Um, one, of his, uh, um, one of his lab mates will be giving a talk tomorrow morning about their COVID response. But their lab, they were basically trying to uh, reclaim lab coats. It's like, why do lab coats have to be this like sterile white like thing? And like in their lab, you know, in Cameroon, their lab coats are like these super vibrant colors, like beautiful garments. And it's like, it has the same function of like protecting you from like spills and stuff that like, instead of it being this like sterile white thing, it's like celebrate your culture while you're doing wet lab work, right? Which is like, you know, you wow. don't think about it until you see it. And then you're like, what the hell are we doing? Like wearing these like totally sterile looking things in a lab, you know? So anyways, I, I, it was really inspiring to see the, the different designs you have for your fluidic devices because it's the same type of thing, right? There's no reason why our, our devices need to, you know, kind of look and feel a certain way, so. Uh, to speak oh, yeah. of your lab coats, um, oh, so I love this my already. bio design challenge team last year, uh, Rolando Perez was our, our like, expert advisor and we got discarded our extra lab coats from a lab at Stanford. And then Rolando's like, well, they should personalize it. So we got a bunch of patches and the day one. So cool. They, <laughs> you know, in the patches that they wanted. So cool. <laughs> so um, anyway, I was just, I agree with you, like reclaim what is a lab coat and what does it look like? And, and um, what are what are our science spaces and who's engaging? And who's engaging in design the, the tools? So I, that's what I really appreciate about the Prakash lab and Manu speaking this morning, because I think it's not just bringing in tools to people to do testing. It's like having them design the tools themselves. Amazing. So thank you all. Thank you, David, for coming here. So <laughs> nice to see you. Nice. And Patrick, too. Thank you so much for your comments. And everyone in Muhammad and, and Jessica. It's nice to meet you. It's the first time I met you. <laughs> so thank you, Colin. OK, Betty, it's all yours. All right. Well, what a great way to end it with David popping in last minute and David coming from behind. All right. So snaps to Corinne for awesome, awesome workshop. And amazing that we tied it to Metaphotics. And that invitation is open to not, not just Corinne, but to anybody who is working in microfluidics, sorry, micro millifluidics, or you're going to start. Hit us up on Metaphotics. We'd love to see what you do. Even if it's if you say it's amateur or beginner, all of that needs to be shared. It's your idea. Betty, thank you so much. And I didn't know at the beginning of this that you were part of Metafluidics. So I wish that I had given space for you to talk. I hope to hear more. I, I'm good. I've been talking about it for three years now. Oh. <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you as the, the MC. So thank you.